Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. My name is Tilly and I am a strength and conditioning coach. Now before we get into the actual content of today's video, I just want to remind you that the primary thing that I'm trying to get across is that just because someone has a big social media following, it doesn't mean what they say is true. As we go through this video, I just want to remind you to think twice or question a little bit more critically the things that we see online. And so today we are going to be talking about arguably the best marketed exercise in the world. The hip thrust. Now, for those of you who don't spend all of your time on YouTube or TikTok watching fitfluencers rave about the importance of training your bum, then you might have missed out on knowing what a hip thrust is. A hip thrust is just an exercise that is designed to maximize the loading of our glute musculature, to maximize the loading of our butt. The primary muscles that are used in this exercise are the glutes and the hamstrings, particularly the glute max. The secondary muscles are the adductors or our inner thighs, and then some of our glute medius and glute minimus. The the exercise of the hip thrust has been around for a really long time, but it was popularized in about 2006 by a man named Brett Contreras. He came up with the barbell hip thrust. Brett has become better known now as the glute guy. Brett has done his PhD in the hip thrust, and so he spent countless hours and years working on the science behind it so that he can try and encourage the buy-in of everybody around him. And by all accounts, Brett has been pretty successful at this because the hip thrust is now synonymous with booty building, so to getting those large large glute muscles, and to some extent it's become synonymous with better athletic performance. Now while I love a good old bodybuilding workout, my primary interest lies within athletic performance. So just remember that what I'm presenting to you today is going to come more from the lens of athletics and performance, however there will be some reference to hypertrophy. Today I'm going to show you guys why a lot of the research that Brett has published is problematic and to be frank a little bit dishonest. So first let's take a look at one of Brett's articles. In this, Brett explores how the back squat compares to the barbell hip thrust by using EMG data. EMG is a research method that we use and it stands for electromyography. Simply put, it detects the electrical activity emanating from the muscles. In this article, the glute guy found that the barbell hip thrust elicited more muscle excitation in the upper glute max, the lower glute max, and the hamstring musculature. And I mean, that sounds great, right? This literature pretty confidently suggests that the barbell hip thrust could be a great alternative to the back squat. And to be honest with you, in a lot of cases, I might not disagree. However, let's discuss our first problem with this piece of research. There are protocols that we as exercise scientists have to follow when we're using the EMG to make sure that we're doing it correctly and to make sure that we're getting the appropriate signals from the muscles that we actually want to be studying. In a similar manner, there are protocols that we have to follow to normalize the EMG, which just means that we can compare it effectively to different muscles. There are actually guidelines and recommendations on how to use an EMG properly set by Senium. The Senium project is the surface electromyography for the non-invasive assessment of muscles. So it's a collective of a bunch of different researchers in the European Union who have come together and said that these are the most appropriate protocols to follow when you're using the EMG analysis. However, Brett did not follow these protocols. Instead, Brett chose a different method of normalizing his EMG. He chose a standing glute squeeze. And this is instead of the prone squeeze that is recommended by Senium. The standing method is not as reliable as the prone method. In a previous paper that Brett wrote, he himself concluded that if you were to use the standing method, then this could cause the findings of your paper to be way more significant. So why would Brett choose an unreliable method over a tried and tested approach? Let me know what you think down below because I mean I certainly have my theories. The second issue at hand is the conflict of interest that Brett has with his research. In 2011, Brett filed a patent application for a hip thrust apparatus that was was granted in 2012. There are other patents that were filed, but I'm not entirely sure if those were granted. Even if I give him a couple years leeway with the manufacturing process, I assume this would have means he would be selling the hip thrust apparatus machines by about 2014. In this article where Brett and Beardsley discuss the importance of hip dominant exercises like the hip thrust for athletic performance, he fails to declare any conflict of interest. This means that Brett decided that he had nothing that could potentially cloud his judgment on the outcome of this paper. Can this man, the glute guy, who sells all of this and has a patent for a hip thrust apparatus 
really be seen to have no conflict of interest in his work. In fairness to Brett, in his later works, he does declare the patent as a potential conflict of interest. But unfortunately for me, potential is just not convincing enough. To be objective, it would have been nice to see somebody else run the study, someone who is not directly financially benefiting from the outcomes. I realize that's really cynical, but within science, I feel like you kind of have to be. The final issue I'd like to present on the glue guys research is that a lot of it is based on a misunderstanding of basic biomechanical principles. In one paper, Brett and colleagues came up with a theory called the force vector theory. In very simple terms, this theory means that if you need to move horizontally like you would in a sprint, then you should train this by doing horizontal loading patterns like a hip thrust. Seems pretty simple, right? I mean, that could make sense. In the article, Brett and colleagues found that by implementing a six week hip thrust training protocol, they saw improvements in the sprint time of adolescent males when compared to implementing a front squat protocol. And I mean, that theory could lend itself nicely to the force vector theory. Those who trained the hip thrust, the horizontal movement, were better able to improve their horizontal sprinting time, right? However, in the paper, there was no significant change in long jump performance. That's a horizontal movement. So does the theory hold up? In academia, if you write something that other researchers disagree with, then researchers have the ability to publicly challenge you in something called letter to the editor. This is important to remember that these things exist because in social media, if you question somebody or if you publicly challenge them, you can easily be labeled as a hater and your following will most likely agree with you. So let's have a look at this letter to an editor from Bryanton and Chu. This was in response to another Contrast paper, but it may tell us why Brett's force vector theory does not stack up. Bryanton and Chu suggest that if you overvalue the role of the glutes in athletic movement, but you do not concommit increase the quadriceps strength, then you risk unbalancing the dynamic contractions required for athletic movement. In other words, you need strong quadriceps to have strong glutes. You can't have one without the other. Yes, while I absolutely think that if you want a crazy big dump truck, then go train your glutes, go nuts. But I just want you to remember, particularly if you're an athlete outside of bodybuilding, you need to train other parts of the body with equal enthusiasm too. A further issue with the force vector theory is that it can already be accounted for by another biomechanical principle. I won't for you guys too much of the detail here. But essentially, when we think about movement specificity, we need to make sure that we're considering how the force is applied relative to the world. So even though in a sprint, the athlete is actually moving horizontally, they're applying most of their force straight down. If you have a look at this little diagram, you can see the gray arrow is talking about the ground reaction force. So what Brett was doing is that he is considering the force being applied relative to the athlete's frame, but that's not what we're doing here. According to the principle of dynamic correspondence, we have to look at the global frame. So we have to consider it relative to the world. And because most of the force is going straight down, then the hip thrust might not be the most appropriate way to train for a sprint. I mean, what does this movement look like to you? It kind of looks like a squat, right? So we have to consider the athlete relative to the global frame, not the local frame of just the athlete. We need to see how they're actually interacting with the world not just the direction that the athlete is moving. And so there are a few more pieces of literature that I can recommend to you if you wanted to learn more about some of the issues with the hip thrust, but I'm gonna leave it there. Am I arguing for you to never do hip thrusts again? And the answer is no. I mean, I still do hip thrusts. I like them. I think hip thrusts definitely have a place in your programming, particularly if you don't really care about athletic performance, but you're just focused on aesthetics. I think that hip thrusts can be great to develop some crazy hip musculature or a crazy booty. <laughs> I mean, look at some of the results from Brett's clients. Something he's doing as a coach is clearly working and I'm not trying to dispute that. If you like hip thrusts, go nuts. If you don't like them, don't do them. If you're an athlete with goals outside of bodybuilding and you do want to get some sports performance benefits, I would just highly encourage you to ask yourself why you're doing a hip thrust. If you're doing it for aesthetics, like I said, fine. But performance, I'm not entirely convinced that the literature is in support of that. Now with all of that looked at, I just wanted to bring you back to that point that that we made at the beginning. I hope this makes you think twice about what you see on social media. Just because everybody is doing a hip thrust, just because everybody is training their bum, does it mean that you have to? No. Does it mean that you have to make it the most important thing in your training? 
No. Unfortunately, academia is really exclusive, and for that reason, a lot of people miss out on the dialogue that goes on behind the scenes. And it can make it difficult to understand the nuances behind the inclusion of a certain exercise in our training programs. I hope this was kind of entertaining, and I hope you learned something. I'm actually off to go do a hip thrust now. <laughs> But that's it from me today, everybody. I hope you all learned something. If you have any questions, drop them down below. If you liked this video, please remember to like and subscribe because it'll really help support the channel and it'll mean that you get to stay up to date with some really cool sports science discussions. I hope you guys have a great week ahead and I'll catch you next time. See ya, bye.